I am Dr. Catherine Lefebvre. I'm a movement disorder specialist in Saratoga Springs, New York. And I have a pleasure today to talk with Dr. Submaranian, who is a movement specialist and director of the Pedrick Center um, in Los Angeles and also clinical professor at UCLA. And we'll be covering some highlights today from the recent World Parkinson Congress that took place from July 4th to 7th in the beautiful city of Barcelona, Spain. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. I mean, um, you know, after COVID, uh, after being physically separated from our patients and then, you know, with masks, um, largely to be in a conference room in a beautiful city um, across the world and seeing people arriving from all over the world with Parkinson's. It's a really unique con conference because it brings together people living with Parkinson's disease and the people that care for them. And then also basic science researchers, um, physicians, uh, allied health professionals of all sorts, literally all sorts. So sex therapists, um, you know, dietitians, uh, you name it. So for those of us who did not have the opportunity to attend, uh, why don't you walk us through some of the themes that were big at the Congress and some of the things that we missed? Sure. So, I mean, I think that a lot of what I was struck by was just, you know, people coming together to care about the global sort of um, impact of this disease and how, uh, for example, in Africa, there are still many countries in which we can't prescribe levodopa at all. And so I think there's really been a push. And I know um, colleagues, even at the Movement Disorder Society, have made, made this um, a mission sort of of a few, the next few years is to really see if we can get um, these vital medicines to people living with Parkinson's no matter where they live and make it accessible. So I think that's been part of um, the, the push. And there was a lot of um, presentations on some of this information. And I think uh, a highlight for me from the African uh, experience was um, Dr. Mizba, Tash Mizba has written a paper about stigma um, in uh, Africa. And um, we met um, and, and were able to applaud uh, the beautiful work of um, a gentleman named Hennington, um, who is um, the son of a Parkinson's patient, and she passed away a number of years ago, but had really lived with the stigma. They had hit her in a back room, hadn't uh, had snuck food down um, through the door, had really kept her away from anyone who would come over or let her out. And really, he um, has realized that this is not the way to treat uh, these sort of folks, now that he's more educated, there was a sense that there may be some witchcraft involved or, you know, really um, unclear uh, um, education and disease awareness in many of these parts. And so I think, um, you know, he has done really grassroots work, um, beautiful work. Um, he described uh, taking pieces of paper and writing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease down on these pieces of paper and posting them in buses locally and having his phone number there and telling people to call him if he had those symptoms. And through that type of grassroots intervention, he has gathered people living with Parkinson's disease throughout Uganda and has really been able to sort of dispel these myths and really educate and bring people together. So I think in the you know um, continent of Africa, there's a push, there's now some grant funding, um, a lot of push even at the Movement Disorder Society to bring support groups, um, education to nurses, people on the ground um, to really uh, raise disease awareness so this was really a beautiful, beautiful um, story, and he won an award there at that meeting. So I think that was one of my highlights, and I got to meet him, and just great energy. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's also a good opportunity to remind, uh, you know, such as a World Congress, to really not uh, just talk about therapeutic updates that might be accessible to us in the U.S. or other parts of the world, but, um, you know, uh, realize that this is what we talk about usually at many of our congresses is not applicable to everyone so i think that's a really important initiative yes i was following along on social media i have to say and i did see a lot of uh, chatter around the topic of self-monitoring of parkinson's symptoms and so on so i don't know if you maybe want to talk about that yeah so um Dr. Sarah Regari, she just got her um, PhD, very proud of her. Um, she's uh, in the, a very amazing woman living with Parkinson's disease. She has a child. She actually has had it, I think, since um, I think her, her teens. Um, she has worked with uh, Professor Boss Bloom to work on a PhD thesis around um, monitoring um, for patients living with Parkinson's. Her sense is that physicians see patients in the office one day out of 365 or you know, one day in six months uh, for a few minutes. And that time frame is used to then treat um, you know, the next six months. And that she really thinks that gathering information, being aware of your own symptoms through tracking um, and uh, bringing this information 
uh, to doctors is really key. There was a lot of information about using um, remote monitoring, um, more about telehealth and you know its benefits, um, and really sort of engaging not just that you know five minute um, motor exam in the clinic, but really sort of um, you know can we uh, get um, sort of a, a global sense of how the person living with Parkinson's has been doing for the last six months using various data tracking um, devices. And I think on that note, there was also um, some apps that were presented and um, Rochelle Flanagan, who is a colleague, um, and we wrote a paper actually on gaps in care of women. Um, she's made a beautiful app that just is launching called My Moves Matter, um, really incorporating um, as an example, the menstrual cycle and how that may impact uh, women living with Parkinson's disease or the perimenopausal timeframe and trying to kind of track symptoms because um, many women have found it hard to figure out what are the symptoms that are more um, from the hormonal changes, what are the symptoms related to their levodopa um, changes, and then to be able to give that in a useful way um, over uh, you know, a period of time of tracking to the physician to be able to regulate meds has been kind of an aspiration that was really thought of by the women, uh, for women, and, and has actually, you know, in the last year, been brought uh, to actual reality. So it's pretty amazing. We can link to that app and in our uh, notes uh, later. You're really interested in lifestyle and wellness interventions for Parkinson's. I think there's a keynote talk about uh, the role of a dietitian, Parkinson's. So yeah, so um, any any updates on that uh, front? Yeah, I mean, I think this type of meeting just brings people together who ordinarily wouldn't be able to connect. And a lot of what I've been noticing is that we are very siloed in uh, our neurology box and we feel overwhelmed with the 15 minute follow-up or the 30 minute follow-up and how are we gonna counsel on, you know, all these sort of exercise things or diet or, you know, social connection, things like that, that we, we know, you know, can make a difference. I think that engaging the multidisciplinary team, thinking about you know who we may be able to make a referral to, and in a proactive way. So I think you know a lot of the meeting was talking about a uh, concept of maybe prehab. Um, we've also talked about a wellness prescription that we're trying to formulate with a wellness task force at the Movement Disorder Society. But the sense that you have a disease with a trajectory, we now have a sense that we may even be able to identify people in the prodromal phase um, with a number of um, things like, you know, sense of smell and sleep, um, you know, issues, REM behavior disorder, biopsies, genetics, you know, we have, you know, these mounting ways to diagnose this disease earlier and earlier. And then what do we offer those patients? And so I think the sense is that we should really be engaging the multidisciplinary team and a number of the phys phys physical therapists from around the world and other folks have been presenting on this concept of not just reacting to uh, things, but really, um, you know, sort of proactively educating, maybe meeting the patient at diagnosis, and then, you know, um, teaching people how to live better uh, through a time frame. So I think that's very exciting to me because, you know, when we talk about wellness, we're really talking about proactive lifestyle choices that patients can make and then feel like they are the agent of their own outcomes. And, you know, that message uh, throughout was really defined by patients that they don't want to be passive. They want to be active, um, you know, sort of members of their team and really be in the center and have personalized approaches to them. Um, so I think this was really very helpful um, to have uh, sort of patients come and describe that um, out loud and have these various uh, types of healthcare providers there on the ground to support that. Yeah, and it's always a good reminder for us, we're not a single person who have to do it all, but it's really important to, to gather a team who can really help to provide the best care for, the, for the each patient. Yeah, I think um, I think one topic I definitely was curious about, um, and you had kind of mentioned uh, was on the agenda was Dr. Fasano talking about COVID updates and Parkinson's. I know there was um, sort of a sense of the beginning of a pandemic or kind of middle of a pandemic that there might be an increased rate of Parkinson's. So what's the update on that? He presented, I think, a series of 44 articles with 93 patients um, involved. And these were just sort of general articles um, that he had screened. And a lot of articles actually um, were published during that time frame that have since been redacted. A lot of things that were rapidly thrown out there. And then when people really looked at the data, some redaction of some of that information. So I think, you know, some of the sense, some of that hype has, I think, been sort of tempered a little bit. So in this uh, 93 patients, these are um, patients live uh, with all kinds of movement disorders. There was a, a subset 
with Parkinsonism. And in that subset, um, there was an, uh, some that were levodopa responsive. And when you really look back at those patients who are levodopa responsive, there is a sense that those patients had prodromal symptoms. So I think the sense that you have de novo Parkinson's disease caused by the virus is really very rare if it does occur, is, is the sort of take home message. Yeah, well, that is very reassuring to hear that this connection of the, the, the kind of feared about with COVID triggering Parkinson's disease maybe seemed not to pan out and was more uh, association rather than a causation piece. So that's good to know that you hear that update. Yeah, well, I, I know it's always hard to summarize four days of a meeting and in and, and like 10 minutes, but any other topics um, you wanted to talk about or mention? to us. So just to update on uh, the women's issues in Parkinson's, Sonia Mathur, who is a family doc um, living in Toronto, um, she's a remarkable advocate. Um, she and, and a team of other women did a survey um, of 248 women looking at uh, their needs, their thoughts, and things like that. And I think we still, you know, have a very strong sense that women themselves are not um, really aware of how, you know, hormones and things like that can affect their Parkinson's. I think, um, you know, up to 50% of them did not know um, much about this uh, area at all. And they also felt like their healthcare team was not interested and was not really inquiring about any of the sort of gender specific types of things um, in this space. Uh, and I think that, you know, women have been rallying together. It was really beautiful to sort of meet the women that, um, you know, had had sort of honestly spearheaded the paper that we wrote. There's a new registry, pregnancy registry, that was just started by Annelien Oosterbaan, who is um, in the Netherlands, also working with uh, Professor Blom, uh, called PregSpark, P-R-E-G-S-P-A-R-K dot com. And this is a registry for women worldwide. So if we have uh, folks out there with women that are pregnant with Parkinson's, please have them um, go on the site and, and register because I think, you know, we, we really want to gather information and, and the women themselves are doing this grassroots work. So, so it's very exciting. And just on the note of Rochelle as well in the dietitian piece, um, yes, yeah, she, she did a beautiful um, job describing the role of a dietitian on the team uh, for Parkinson's disease. And I think, you know, they are sometimes an uh, underutilized um, specialty. And, and so educating more dietitians about the specific needs of Parkinson's and then engaging a dietitian if you do have one um, in, in your, um, you know, sort of midst um, is, is definitely, you know, something that she spoke uh, very passionately about as she is a dietitian living with Parkinson's herself. But um, thank you so much for the opportunity to bring some of the excitement from that meeting. Um, if anyone is out there and it's, you know, wanting some uh, thing to really, you know, engage them uh, if they're burnt out or, you know, rekindle some sparks about why we went into medicine. I think the field of Parkinson's and the unmet needs are very uh, ripe for um, getting involved in advocacy. Good parting words. And I think always good to remember really considering partnering with our patients rather than just uh, seeing them and giving them a prescription and really having that multidisciplinary approach and, and relying on, on uh, multidisciplinary teams to, to achieve that. So um, excellent. Well, thank you so much. It was good talking to you and uh, have a good rest of your day.